Okay, so um, so we are recording this webinar. So if anyone would like um, a copy of it or to share it with anyone, um, you can just let us know, and we will be happy um, to to share that. And so our just to give us to give you guys a brief introduction to who we are, Advantage Kentucky Alliance is the official representative of the Manufacturing Extension partnership national network in Kentucky. And we are focused on helping small and medium sized manufacturers thrive in today's technology driven economy. And so we help, we help our manufacturers become more globally competitive so that they can retain and even create additional industry and jobs within the state of Kentucky. So we also, um, we offer expertise training and facilitated planning to help identify areas of improvement, streamline processes, increase competitiveness, and create new rev revenue streams for, for, for your business. Advantage Kentucky Alliance has received CARES Act funding uh, to help alleviate impacts from COVID-19 to Kentucky manufacturers. And this funding allows us to provide no cost services to to manufacturers around Kentucky. Cost services include maintenance assessments, operational assessments. Uh, we have supply chain, a supply chain assessment, as well as a COVID-19 reopening audit and a health and safety gap analysis. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these no cost services, you can visit our website, advantageky.org, and we would, um, or you can can email me. We'd love to, to share more information with you. Um, so today we have with us Marvin Maddox. He, um, we're happy to have him share his expertise with us. He is the exporting specialist at Advantage Kentucky Alliance. He had received his marketing degree from Purdue University. He started his international business career with Caterpillar, where he worked as a product support marketing engineer. Uh, he then got a master's in international management at Thunderbird School in Arizona. He has spent 20 years living and working overseas, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Turkey. And in Singapore, he worked for the consulting firm Business International. Uh, he has owned his own consulting company where he worked for US and European companies. He um, brings considerable international sales management experience to his consulting work. And so we are happy to have him with us today. He will um, be sharing um, paperwork that is important for export exporting. And so um, if you have any questions, uh, like I said at the beginning, you can um, ask them anytime. You can put them in the chat. We will have a time, um, some time at the end for questions or comments. And so I will turn the time over to, to Marvin and let him get started. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our, our webinar. We call it CARES Act webinar uh, this afternoon, uh, talking a little bit about uh, getting the paperwork right from an export documentation standpoint. Um, understand that this is not, you know, this webinar is not, you know, it, it's not completely to make you an expert on the subject in the course of about 30 minutes or so, something like that. I'm sure we all realize that, but you know, hit the high. We, we want to hit the high points, and um, again, we'll have some time at the end where we can open it up to questions, and uh, you know, either just general ones or or specific, you know, to, to your company. I saw, I see Bill, I see your Bill Hilliard, I see you're there. I'm, I may use you as a as a guinea pig for a couple examples or something like that as well. So uh, so stand by for that, as it were, uh, Bill. With that, um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Kim. Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk about. You know, this is kind of our laundry list of things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about invoicing, both commercial as well as pro forma invoicing. Talk a little bit about export licensing. And again, we could, we could spend a whole afternoon talking about export licensing and export control and commerce control list and things like that and ECCN numbers. Uh, again, this is just to hit the high points, basically. But you know, we could we could at another time we could we could devote a whole webinar just to the the issue of export licensing and things like that. 
certificate of origin, again, also, or certificate of um, manufacture is, again, particularly relevant, particularly when you talk about trade, uh, treaty, free trade agreements and things like that, USMCA, or what I call NAFTA 3.0. Um, you know, again, there's, there are specific local content and, and, or, and you know, origin of manufacture requirements there in terms of the new USMCA thing, particularly in the automotive sectors. So um, any of them, one here that it pertains to automotive, we could certainly talk about that offline if you'd like. Uh, certificate of inspection. Um, oftentimes, you know, we need a third party that's kind of between the buyer and the seller. And so um, having an outside agency, whether it's government, governmental or a private sector agency, and I'm using the example of SGS, which is, stands for Society General de Surveillance, which is a company based in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, with operations in about 160 countries uh, around the world. Uh, they can be that kind of third party intermediary in providing testing and inspection services for cargoes and product even before they get on a, on a boat. And then finally, we'll talk about bills of lading. Again, this could be a subject for a whole afternoon webinar, but so we're just gonna hit the high points basically and, uh, and, and go on from there. Kim, you wanna move on? So let's talk a little bit first about commercial invoices and commercial invoices basically in, in layman's terms, we would call these a bill, okay? And, and the idea basically is, you know, when you, when you have a shipment going overseas, there has to be a commercial invoice accompanying it. And, and basically that becomes the bill, if you will, that, uh, you know, bet issued by the seller to the, to the buyer. So we're, we're gonna cover obviously the buyer and seller, the company, the parties involved in the transaction, uh, Pretty detailed description of the merchandise, uh, unit cost, uh, currency of billing, is it US dollars? Is it, I'll show you an example in just a second at where it's pound sterling. The, uh, the second, the other things that are gonna cover are things like HTS codes, harmonized tariff system codes, or in the case of US export schedule B codes. INCO terms, International Chamber of Commerce terms and terms basically defined at what point ownership moves from the buyer, from the seller to the buyer, if you will. Again, Inco terms, we could spend a whole afternoon talking a little bit about that. So we're not gonna, we're just gonna hit the high points, but understand that Inco terms have changed recently. Uh, in January of this year, basically they came out with the 2020 version of Inco terms. Prior to that, uh, the last update, if you will, the last change was in 2000, 2010. So we're, you know, some of the terms that were used in the past uh, have changed. So just, you know, be aware of that for the most part. Again, country of manufacturer origin, we talked about that. Uh, ECCN, export control classification number. And then basically, as most, of, most companies will have a chop or, or a stamp on their commercial invoice that says basically that goods will not be transshipped. Um, many years ago, um, as the North Koreans kind of were uh, starting their nuclear develop, you know, nuclear um, weaponry development. There was a big scandal in uh, involving Toshiba, which is a machine tool, a Japanese machine tool manufacturer, where products that were shipped to, to Hong Kong ultimately ended up in North Korea, and they were used again, high quality, very precise machine tools. So again, that has put the onus really things like Iran and Cuba and North Korea in particular about you know saying that goods will not be transshipped from like Singapore or Hong Kong or maybe somewhere in the Middle East. And then finally it just a signature basically so that the buck would stop with someone uh, you know someone from the seller as well in terms of commercial invoice. Kim you want to move on? Um, so again this is just a, a, a sample to take a look at. This is a, a transaction involving a British company shipping a, a Honda lawnmower uh, motor to a customer in the United States. Um, and basically, again, you've got things like, you know, currency of billing, basically, payment terms, INCO terms. Notice here on the right side over there, DDP terms. DDP is an INCO term that stands for delivered duty paid. And so in this example, DDP terms would mean that the seller is responsible for everything up until it arrives at the front door, basically, of the, of the buyer. So again, another example of, uh, of INCO terms there. Pound sterling is the currency for transaction here. And then, you know, again, airway bill numbers and things like that, as well as HTS, HTS codes and things like that. So this is just a, a sample of what a commercial invoice might look like. Um, there is no standard nomenclature or format. Uh, but again, as long as you hit most of all those things that we talked about earlier, um, then I think you're going to be fine. Kim, you want to move on? 
Okay, so um, a pro forma invoice is kind of the opposite side of the coin of a commercial invoice. It's basically a quote, okay? And someone says, well, give me a quote for X, Y, and Z going from here to sing it from, a, from say, Lexington, Kentucky to Singapore. Um, so again, it's basically a quotation. And again, it would include harmonized codes uh, in terms of classifying the product, price, delivery time, shipment terms, again, ports of, of, of uh, exit and entry, and then terms of sale may be, is it gonna be on open account or is it gonna be on you know, net 30 as it were, or 60 day terms or something like that. So again, that's what we mean by a pro forma invoice. And uh, we got a quick video we're gonna show you that kind of differentiates between the two types of invoices. Layman's terms, commercial invoices are basically a bill. It's, it's useful it's used for customs clearance purposes. It's, a, it's an accounting entry. It's in terms of your uh, P&L, &L, &L, as it were, and things like that, ultimately ends up maybe as accounts receivable on your balance sheet, this type of thing. Uh, again, conversely, a, a pro forma invoice basically is just a give me a quote or give me a shoot me a pro forma for the most part. And internationally, people tend to use pro forma um, and then domestically just said, you know, send me a quote or give me a proposal or something like that. Okay, you wanna move on, Kim? Um, consular invoices are kind of a, a separate thing on themselves, not as common as they used to be anymore, but occasionally um, one will have to go to the embassy or consulate uh, and actually get, you know, pay, pay a fee, if you will, a processing fee in order to receive a consular invoice. I can remember years ago when I was with Raytech, a company that made infrared uh, thermometers and thermal imaging equipment, um, we had an order in Indonesia, it was to a government department and they required a consular invoice. So I had to spend an afternoon from driving from Santa Cruz up to, to San Francisco to the Indonesian consulate there. Um, the invoice was prepared in Bahasa, Indonesia, their local language basically. And and so basically, that you know, it was it was kind of a waste of a day basically, but Again, that's, that's, it's all part of getting the paperwork right, as it were. Uh, increasingly, you don't see this as much anymore. It used to be kind of a way to, to a revenue stream for the, the local consulate, as it were, or something like that, that to raise some money for their, I think for their retirement fund or something like that. But again, not, not, not as common as it used to be. So you, don't, you probably won't run into that going forward too much. Okay, Kim? Okay, so... Let's talk a little bit about certificate of manufacturer, certificate of origin. Um, again, these are things that are kind of quarterbacked and managed by the International Chamber of Commerce. And then in turn, they kind of evolve it down or, or kind of delegate the responsibility for certificate of origins to the local Chamber of Commerce. So the American Chamber of Commerce, for example, uh, is responsible again for American manufacturers and exporters. And in, and in turn, in fact, they've actually outsourced it as well to another organization and, and hence this, this, this notice here, it says outsourced to American World Trade Chamber of Commerce, which is kind of a, in a sense, it's been kind of outsourced and, and managed on, on behalf of the US Chamber of Commerce. So let's click on their website real quick, just to get a sense of kind of who they are and what they do. And this is their, their website uh, that talks about certificate of origins uh, this time again. Again, certificate of origins is particularly important when you're a US exporter shipping to a, company, a country like Korea or Colombia, Australia, Chile, where again, where we have a free trade agreement in place with them in order to qualify for those concessionary tariff rates under that FTA. 
again, it has to be U.S. product. And again, as a minimum, it has to be 51%. And again, depending on the nature of the product they, with the new USMCA for the automotive sector, going as high as 75%. So go, go from there. And then there's another reference there. Again, um, once you get that certificate of origin, Kim, the other site, uh, if you could click on that as well, the second one, uh, that talks about how you can actually verify that it is a valid certificate of origin. Yeah, this is again, certificateoforigin.com. And you can see for the countries flags down below, we've got you know Russia, Sweden, uh, Norway, Mexico, Canada, the US, uh, Israel. Uh, there's even the Seychelles thrown in there on the lower right. But again, you can take your certificate of origin number and enter it on this website to see if, if it is a valid you know, certificate of origin um, number, basically, for the most part. Okay, all right, let's move on. Okay, um, certificate of inspection. Again, oftentimes um, you need a third party intermediary that is, is stands between the buyer and seller. Uh, to, and it's, it's used primarily for qualitative uh, inspections, but it can also be in terms of volume or quantitative inspections as well. But often required for things like grain, you know, again, grain, for example, you have to measure the moisture content. Is there, if there's too much moisture in there, obviously that has an impact on the quality of the product and things like that. Food products, particularly uh, pharmaceutical products would be another good example, live animals. Again, before those are shipped, you know, if you're New Zealand and you're selling sheep to Saudi Arabia, or if you're um, Argentina shipping cattle to, uh, to Turkey, uh, again, you wanna make sure that those <coughs> animals have all the necessary, you know, health certificates and things like that in that regard. Uh, I lived in Singapore for a number of years, and one of the companies that I used to do consulting with is SGS, again, this Geneva-based company. And um, again, they operate now in about 160 plus countries around the world. And again, they can play that role of being that kind of independent third party. I'm gonna show, again show you just a quick video because I, this explains much better than I probably could exactly what a company like SGS brings to the table. And they're, they're really global and worldwide, worldwide reach. Exactly what is it that you do? It's the question I get asked all the time about SGS. SGS is the world leading inspection, verification, testing, and certification company. That's what SGS does, but that doesn't come close to explaining the impact we have on lives and businesses around the world. We have built trust between people, organizations, and governments. You reduce risk, making business faster, simpler, and more efficient. Wherever companies are in the world, we respond to their needs. Enhancing quality and improving productivity. Working across industries. Getting products to market faster. When we talk about sustainability, we don't just use it as a buzzword. To us, it's a business imperative. For long-term success, we ensure quality, safety, and efficiency. We create clarity throughout supply chains, from raw materials, to finished products and beyond. And that gives our customers a real competitive edge. At SGS, we look beyond the obvious, challenging conventional wisdom. When you need to be sure, we give you the truth. Clear and simple, allowing you to make the right decision. We help government simplify trade, prevent counterfeiting, and protect revenue. We give peace of mind when contractual and regulatory obligations have to be met. When 
products and services are safer, more reliable and better value, we all benefit. Of course, it's not just using the right technology that matters. It's combining that technology with expertise and industry knowledge that makes the difference. SGS works with clients to develop innovative services and technologies customized to their needs. We make sure that vital environmental resources like forestry and fisheries are monitored and protected. We oversee aid and development projects, making sure that money gets to where it can do the most good. That way donors can trust that their contributions have the greatest impact on those in need. So when people ask me, exactly what is it that you do, my answer is this. We identify best practices and optimize processes. We enhance quality, ensure compliance, reduce risk and improve productivity. We make industries, businesses and governments more efficient. Ultimately, it's not about what we do, it's what we make possible that's important. Okay, again, uh, SGS is a company I, I know well. I used to work very closely with their offices in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and so let me just give you an example, Bill. I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. But let's assume Bill for, is from Atalo, Atalo Holdings, uh, a major CBD manufacturer in the state of Kentucky. And uh, let's give an example. Let's assume that Bill was shipping a, a CBD product, uh, let's say, somewhere in uh, South America or something like that. Uh, if you needed a third-party verification on the percentage of THC, for example, in that particular product or that particular shipment, you, know, you could do your own analysis in your own labs, obviously, but oftentimes a, a government entity or, or an end-user customer may say, well, we need somebody that's kind of a third-party independent to verify the, the chemistry, if you will, and stuff like that. So that, you know, that would be just one example. You can work with a company like SGS. They have immense laboratory capabilities and you know analytical instrumentation and things like that uh, to do that kind of testing work for the most part and then once they <coughs> once they end, end once they issue their certificate of inspection basically that that's considered pretty much gold for the most part again SGS is, is not the only company that does it but they're kind of considered the gold standard when it comes to um, issuing those types of a certificate okay well, yeah. sure if SGS did the inspection, is that binding on the buyer, typically? Well, basically, buyer and seller would agree up front that 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 you know an independent company like SGS, and and again, they operate in over 160 countries around the world. That their certificate of inspection would be you know the the de facto standard, if you will. So if you if Atalo said it was you know 3.25, and somebody else said it was 4.8 or something like that. Um, there would be, you know, the, between buyer and seller, there may be a major disagreement, obviously. But, you know, the, the, it's kind of like, you know, when you buy a house and you have an inspector come out to do all the inspections and make sure everything is the, the way it should be and things like that. They play that role of independent, that independent uh, company uh, kind of operate again between buyer and seller. So would the inspection be done prior to issuance of the commercial invoice? Uh, it would probably, you know, the timing usually is done right before shipment, for example. Again, in Singapore, Singapore is a major, for example, a major petroleum put, uh, hub, as you will. There's a lot of refineries there and a lot of transshipments of petroleum. And so oftentimes, again, you know, they'll take samples, you know, literally as that cargo is being, as that, say, crude oil is being loaded on a tanker, you know, they, they have inline sam sampling capabilities. They would then send it back to their lab and issue their certificate. You know, for example, with petroleum, sometimes you have to worry about whether it's light crude, heavy crude, percentage of sulfur content and things like that for crude oil shipments. <clears throat> Again, both buyer and seller would recognize the, the, the capability and the expertise of a company like SGS to play that third-party intermediary between buyer and seller. Okay, thanks. 
All right, let's move on. I think we've just got a couple more slides and we'll open up for some more questions. Um, export license I threw in here just so that we, we can touch on it. Understand that for probably 98%, maybe even 99% of the products that Kentucky exporters are gonna be shipping overseas, um, you, don't, you, know, you don't need an export license. It's what we call a general export license. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. For example, uh, a validated export license basically is, it may be a strategic commodity, uh, it may be a shipment. For example, a couple of years ago, you know, we hadn't been doing many, many shipments to Cuba, but we do ship things like medical products and things like that, humanitarian products to, to Cuba still. And so, um, again, that would, re that would require a validated license. So this would be specific products to a specific country. North Korea would be a good example as well. Iran, this type of thing. Typically, you know, for, for those countries, you know, it you, you've got quite a bit of paperwork involved for the most part. And, and really the issue for, for America, from, the, from a gov US government standpoint is they wanna, they wanna make sure that products that have dual use, and I use the word dual use basically having both military as well as commercial um, you know, applications, if you will, um, don't, get, don't get sent to the wrong place, whether it's North Korea. Again, I used that example early on about a Toshiba, a Japanese machine tool manufacturer shipping stuff to Hong Kong where it got transshipped onto North Korea, uh, where it was used to help kind of improve the capability of their nuclear weapons stockpile and things like that. So again, definitely a no-no there for the most part. Kim, if you could click on that, I'll give you another real life example from my experience with Raytech. If you could click on the TI-30 uh, logo down at the bottom there, Kim. Uh, when I work with Raytech, a manufacturer of temperature measuring and thermal imaging equipment, now, now part of Fluke, um, we introduced in, I think it was 2004, the, the Thermoview TI-30, basically. Um, this particular product, depending on who we're sending it to, would require an export license. So for example, if we send it to a NATO country in Europe, Norway, Sweden, France, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, required no license, no export license from the US government uh, through the, the Department of Commerce. Conversely, uh, if we shipped it to South America, if we shipped it to most countries in Asia, with the exception, I think, uh, be in Japan, it required an export license. And, and again, this is an example, a good example of a dual use technology. Because you can see a thermal imaging uh, camera like this, like the, the TI-30, can be used for industrial maintenance, electrical, mechanical, looking at you know, hot bearings and uh, bad connections on a, on a, a uh, breaker box or something like that. So it has certainly has a, a, a very relevant use in terms of taking pictures of, of these types of, types of um, types of applications for preventative maintenance. But conversely, what the Department of Defense was worried about was that this particular product, which had a refresh rate, it had a video output basically. So it had a, a frame per second rate of about 31 frames per second, which is video quality output. What they were concerned about that, that this product could be reconfigured, they could take the internal parts and it could be the basis for a heat seeking missile, okay? So again, a good, you know, we didn't think about it at the time we were developing this product, but again, DOD people, that's what they're, you know, that's what they're paid to do. And so they were concerned, uh, the reason why they imposed this licensing regime on the TI-30 uh, when I was at Raytech was because they were concerned that again, that it had military applications, particularly uh, they thought some of the internal mechanics could be put on a, on a war, as on a warhead basically and used as a heat seeking missile. So again, a good example of, kind of dual use technology that the government wants to control. This, what we did in the end was we ended up downgrading the frame rate, <coughs> the refresh rate from, <coughs> from 31 frames per second down to 20. The DOD said fine, it would, it would not function then as a, as a kind of a guidance system. Safety missile, and it was, it, it, at that point in time, from there on, did not require an export license anywhere in the, in the world at that point. Kim, you wanna move on to the next one? All right, we're going to end today talking a little bit about bills of lading, and and all these all these documentation that we talked about are important, but I'd say probably the two most important from an export standpoint would be the bill of lading as well as the commercial invoice, or uh, sometimes if it's an air shipment, we call we call it, we use the word airway bill as a, rather than bill of lading. But understand that a bill of lading has three functions. Okay, first of all, it's it's a contract of carriage between the shipper and the carrier. 
and it you know spells out the rates and the cost. You know, maybe we're shipping two container, two 40-foot containers from Port of New Jersey to Singapore. So it spells out the cost for that. So it's it it is a contract of carriage. It's it's it, and again it, it spells out exactly so that there's no misunderstanding to ship these three these three containers from New Jersey to Singapore, what it's actually gonna cost the the um, the uh, seller basically. The second function of a bill of lading basically is that it becomes kind of a, a receipt, okay? It's a document issued by the carrier to the to the uh, the seller or shipper, acknowledging that the goods have been received and they're on board and there's basically no damage, if you will, okay? And so think of analogies, let's say you're taking your wife out to dinner and it's winter time and maybe she's got her mink coat on or or you've got your nice leather jacket on or something like that and you want to go to leave that there at the coat check stand and they're going to give you kind of a little a little tab or maybe just a tear off tag or something like that and says that you can collect your coat on your way out basically that's essentially what this is a bill of lading is kind of that analogy it's kind of a receipt to say that from for both sides that it's goods have arrived and they're now been kind of conveyed over hence the word conveyance over to the uh, the carrier basically and then lastly um the other function of a bill of lading is it becomes a title or document of transfer or ownership again this is kind of a kind of a trivial example but let's assume that we're running a relay race okay you can kind of envision the bill of lading as kind of like that baton that it gets passed from runner number one to runner number two number three and number four uh, and so basically that bill of lading kind of goes with and it and it basically the, the holder of that bill of lading uh, it becomes again a document of transfer of ownership and so if, like if we're talking about transfer and ownership from seller to buyer as the case may be and so again bill of lading plays plays that role for the most part so again important to keep those three kind of functions in mind for the most part and then finally kind of a quick twist on bill of lading a clean bill of lading means the cargo is okay there's no damage it's been loaded on there and then increasingly nowadays in this era of what we call multimodalism multimodality meaning things like you know, road shipments, truck shipments, air, rail, sea. Um, a through bill of lading basically can be used in two different in two different modes. So let's take an example. Let's say, for example, you've got a shipment that's leaving Lexington, Kentucky, by truck, and it goes then to the port of New Jersey. It gets loaded on a on a ship from. You know, let, let's say that it goes from Lexington to a to a, a rail yard. A CS, CSX is, has a rail yard up in Northwest Ohio. That container then can be put on a rail car and then shipped to New Jersey, it gets trucked then to the port of New Jersey and loaded on the ship. So in that example, that through bill of lading would involve three different transportation, truck, uh, rail, as well as sea freight basically as well. Okay, Kim. Okay, again, I've, I've you know, this is not a, intended to be a, a, a long-winded discussion, just to hit the high points basically of some of the the basic documentation required in, in any kind of export transaction or export shipment. With that, I'm happy to open it up to any questions that you might have. Linda, if you've got some questions, Bill, if you have some additional questions, again, feel free to, to jump in. If it turns out that it's something I can't answer for you right now, we'll certainly certainly get, get back to you in a, in a day or two. Well, I was gonna let Linda go first, but I yeah, on the bill of lading, uh, mm -hmm. the three things that you said that it does um, on the uh, the goods are okay. Uh, that would be limited to what you can determine visually from looking at the packing that that that's in. It would have nothing to do with what was actually in the packaging. That would be a function of of some sort of an SGS inspection or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, what we're really saying is that, you know, it hasn't been dropped in the ocean or it hasn't been, you know, hit by a, by a lift truck or something like that, or somebody didn't put a, a fork on a lift truck right through the side of the container or something like that. Right. And then my other question is uh, on transfer of title. Uh, your coat check, you know, example troubles me. I don't want to think that when I check my coat at the restaurant that I've all of a sudden sold it to the, <laughs> you know, well, the next guy that comes, but no, all kidding aside, the the uh, the tri transfer of title is that a function of the invoice that says that transfer title transfers when it's delivered to the carrier? It would, Bill. It would ultimately 
depend on the INCO terms. Again, I did, I, we didn't have time to jump into all the detail. That's a, that's a separate seminar unto itself. It. But for example, if, if that example that we talked about, that Honda lawnmower engine on that commercial invoice, it said the INCO terms was DDP, delivered duty paid. Okay, so in that example, this British company is shipping a Honda lawnmower engine basically to, I think it's a buyer in Dallas, as I recall. And basically, the seller is covering all the cost and duties up until it arrives at the, at the customer's front door. Okay, that's what we mean by DDP. So that would be spelled out. Um, in, 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 and again, you know, the, the flow of goods and the, and the bill of lading in terms of title transfer kind of, it used to be in the old days, literally, they, they used, people used to get on airplanes. DHL started in, in business because they were shipping products were shipping, being shipped from Asia to the west west coast of the United States. Guys, uh, the guys that started founded DHL would get on an airplane with all the paperwork and bill of lading stuff and arrive in San Francisco or Los Angeles before that shipment arrived. That's how they started their company years ago. So same same kind of thing basically. That I mean, it doesn't it doesn't physically go on board the ship like it did in the old days, um, but increasingly now there everything's done electronically through data exchange and stuff like that. So the income uh, bill of lading are consistent. And yeah, basically the bill of lading kind of has to follow the INCO terms as, as it were. And in this example, if it's a DDP shipment, INCO terms, uh, the transfer, the final transfer will be when those products arrive, you know, duty paid at, in this example, the, the, uh, the buyer in Dallas, Texas. And I'm assuming risk of loss can stays with the same. Stays with the seller. Yeah, again, DDP is kind of, you think of it as a spectrum. You know, on one side of the spectrum, you could talk about X Works or X Factory. Again, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little off subject here, but uh, you know, that's one eco term that basically says you pick it up from my warehouse in in, uh, in Winchester, for example, or something like that. The other side of the other side of the spectrum or the other extreme, uh, basically, a responsibility re remains with the seller until it arrives and the the buyer signs for it in uh, in Dallas, and duties have, are paid on behalf of the buyer. Uh, you know by, you know, it may be a DHL or UPS type shipment or something like that. All right. Thank you very much. Marvin. Sure. Hey, Marvin, we have a question um, that was asked in the chat. It says, what would you say the most common error would be for first time exporters um, attempting to process export documentation on their own? A really good question. Um, I think I think the, the key word there is on their own. Uh, I think that the the, the real the real issue for a new to market exporter is to work with a really good freight forwarder okay and so so that you don't have to kind of go it alone as it were and so oftentimes most of the paperwork uh, with the exception maybe of the commercial invoice most of this this paperwork is going to be handled by your freight forwarder and so you know the purpose of kind of having this webinar today is to kind of you know like anything else it's kind of learning the buzzwords as it were. And so uh, and so that's why we kind of hit the high points of it and so we got, but as a practical matter, uh, a lot of this responsibility would reside with your freight forwarder. And so it's, you know, it's again, it's important to have a freight forwarder that has kind of a global reach, global network, uh, and you just kind of feel comfortable with. And again, some freight forwarders, probably don't want to work with, you know, smaller type companies, you know, they, they tend to work with the, the big guys, the Brown Foremans of the world or the Valvolines or someone like that. But, you know, sometimes you can find a freight forwarder that's kind of in that middle, middle zone for the most part that has a good network, um, but also is willing to kind of educate you and your staff on some of the nuances of, uh, of, of export documentation. Marv, you mentioned the um, INCO terms. Are there new uh, INCO terms for 2020, and do they apply to all forms of international transport? Yes, they are. They are uh, basically, you know, again, INCO terms are something that are managed by the International Chamber of Commerce, and every 10 years they kind of they they kind of convene a group of uh, of industry experts and things like that, and and basically kind of revise those as it were. Uh, one of the biggest changes that, that took effect with the new INCO terms that came out in January of this year was that some INCO terms are very specific to ocean shipping, for example, and other ones are more generic, whether it's, you know, rail, truck, or air, as the case may be. Let me give you an example. There's an INCO term before called FAS, free alongside, 
or FOB, you may have heard the expression FOB, free on board. Again, that, that pertains very specifically to being loaded on a ship. Um, but the other, like other inco terms, DDP, which we talked about earlier with, with Bill, uh, again, that applies to, could be, you know, rail freight or ocean, or ocean freight, or it could be, uh, it'd be trucking or something like that. I'm unmuted now. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Um, we have been exporting on a small level for many years, and I haven't handled the paper paperwork for a long time, but recently my person who was doing that was out for seven weeks during COVID, and uh -huh. I had to do it. And I was um, confused. Uh, apparently, of several of the companies require that we send a an export documentation certifying that our products have not been field tested or shop tested before being packaged and sent. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Because it seems like they would want the opposite, <laughs> that, that it is tested. Yeah, that that one I, I has never really come, come up, to be honest with you, okay. Linda. But again, because um, usually most of the time they want inspection and Again, another example where SGS has become a major player. You saw one example where all, all the the logs there were kind of piled behind the guy, basically. Again, so in, in you know rules on environmental issues and things like that, and and you know keeping the Amazon and so on and so forth. SGS has, has been involved with that. They also are a pretty active player in, in things like the pharmaceutical industry. Counterfeiting, as you know, is a huge issue. The pharmaceutical industry worldwide, for the most part, so they're they're a major player in that as well. But I have not heard. Uh, issues related to field testing, Linda. So that seems a little. Seems I'll try to figure out who that is and get back to you on that. Okay, sounds good. Oh, strange. We 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 in we go ahead and shop test them anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Want to make sure it works before we send it halfway. I know, maybe it, maybe some people perceive that they're getting quote unquote used you, goods or something like that. That's what I was wondering too. But I, that's the only thing I could have could could kind of attach to it. Maybe. Well, okay. Let me, Linda. Let me say that the only time that I've had experience with that was uh, in new stallions in the thoroughbred business. When you're trying, when you're trying to get insurance on a stallion for fertility, uh, they want to make sure that he's the insurance company, Lloyd's of London, would require that he not be tested for fertility before you make application for that insurance. So what might be driving something like that would be a requirement of the insurance company saying, you know, we're only going to insure it for risks. It's unknown risk, put it that way, something like that. Uh, just to see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for anyone else on the, on the, the participants today? Okay, if there's, some, if there's something that comes up down the road, you know, feel free to contact, you know, basically Kim or Stacy can help you out and they can kind of forward it on to me. Bill, did you have one more? I was just going to ask if the materials are, if we can download this so I can print it out since my notes. Yeah, I think Kim's, I think Kim is, or Stacey are going to work on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Any other, any other question? If not, we'll call it a day. Kim, do you want to put a plug in for your next CARES Act uh, webinar that's coming up? Yes. Um, and uh, Bill, to answer your question, I will send out the PowerPoint and the link to the video. Um, to the recording of this of this video so you can have both. Um, I'll send it out to everyone. You may have to give me a day to get the, the video link up and going, but I will send that out. And um, and just to, to let everyone know, we do have our next Lunch and Learn webinar is November 19th, and it's on food and safety regulations. Um, and then we have one, which I would need to get back with you on, the summary of it, but the December 3rd corporate management group, they have, they have somewhat to do with the, the freight, um, the shipping, kind of what um, Marvin was talking about, but I'm not, they haven't given me their summary of their webinar to give you the exact, um, what it is about, but I think it may be of interest and may be of help um, on the, the shipping of, of goods. So those are our upcoming webinars. And again, you can go to advantageky.org and our event page to, re to register for any, um, any of these webinars. 
And I thank everyone for attending. I appreciate your time. And I will be sending out a survey. Um, if you have any further questions, if you have any comments or anything that maybe wasn't answered or you want more information on, there, there's a spot on that survey. You can just put it in there and I will send it on to, to Marvin or to whoever can answer that question for you. So if you can fill out that survey, that would be great. And um, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for, uh, for attending.